In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today, the third Sunday of the month of Misra, and the Church continues to meditate on uh, this kind of last full month of the year on a very essential and important theme. And that is, what is the Church? How do we belong to the Church? How is the Church the body of Christ? And what does that mean? To be a community of human beings who somehow make up the body of Christ. The immediate context of the Gospel, as you've seen, are, is the jealousy of the Jewish scribes, this uh, caste or group of Jewish scholars who were responsible for uh, perhaps copying the manuscripts of the Torah, but also interpreting it, studying it, teaching the Torah. They saw that the Lord Jesus Christ, this young preacher, uh, who did not belong to their group, they saw that he walked around healing, casting out demons, performing all sorts of miracles, things they were not able to do themselves for the people to whom they, uh, to, to, to whom they were entrusted and with whom they were supposed to serve. So instead of looking at the Lord Jesus Christ as completing their weakness, as coming to do that which they were not able to do themselves, they were jealous. And so they, they had to find a reason to explain away this difference in, in powers, this difference in service. And they said, oh, he must be doing this by the power of demons themselves. He looks like he's casting out demons, but don't be fooled. He's doing this by the power of demons. So the Lord's response to them is a logical one. And we all understand this. If demons are going to cast out demons, then the kingdom of the devil himself will not stand. So your own excuse or your own defense of what it is that I'm doing and how I'm doing it doesn't stand even the test of reason. But what he was saying was also directed at the scribes themselves, not simply to exonerate himself. He was saying, you, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, are supposed to be working for the greater good of your people, to be united together and not divided, seeking your own benefit or seeking to preserve your own authority or position, and therefore failing to serve. And so he was telling them, any kingdom, whether it's the kingdom of demons, or it's your own kingdom, your own Jewish kingdom, cannot stand because you're not working for the greater good of your people, but you're working for your own benefit. Internal dissent and troubles from within are very common. And throughout the history of the church, even our church, this has always been a recurrent problem because we are a collection of human beings, different, created uniquely, and, and unfortunately, don't always share the same spirit of God. So you gather people together into one polity, one community, and we're supposed to be this unified, functional body of Christ for the edification of the church and also for the edification of the entire world. But our differences sometimes get the best of us. One of the most uh, interesting and uh, interesting books about the history of the Coptic Church in the medieval period. Uh, it's called The Coptic Papacy in Islamic Egypt. It's written by a great teacher of mine and a mentor, Professor Mark Swanson of uh, the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. And it's considered a standard textbook on the subject of this history of the Coptic Church from the, from the Arab conquest in the seventh century until around the 15th century. And he has a chapter in there called Troubles from Within. And he draws on primary sources that are the lives of the uh, patriarchs of Alexandria. These are much more expanded lives than what we hear often in the Synaxar, which tends to be a very edited version of some of the, the more troubling uh, anecdotes and stories that we hear about in primary sources. And he tells you just one example of the case of the, the married rich businessman named Isaac, son of Anthony, or as he's called in Arabic, Ishaq ibn Anduna because that was medieval Arabic and it was weird. This rich married man, businessman, and you know, money and those who possess it, money and those who possess it have always been a great temptation to the church. He was sought out by some of the bishops in Cairo and they asked him to run for patriarch and to campaign in Alexandria among the people of Alexandria on the slogan that he will rebuild the churches out of his own pocket, out of his own fortunes. Again, he's a, he's a married man with two sons. The plan failed because of the strong protests of some of the southern Egyptian bishops, the Sa'ida, 
They rose up and said, no way, this is not going to be the patriarch. He is married and he has a lot of money. But the one that became Pope, in fact, was Pope Yusab I. He wanted to please this rich man. Again, the temptation of money within the church. And he ordained Ishaq ibn Anton a deacon and then ordained him bishop over the diocese of Osim, which is a famous diocese slightly south of, each of Cairo. He was bishop of this diocese. After Ishaq ibn Antona died, his son Theodore went to the governor of Egypt and bought him to compel the patriarch to ordain him bishop over the same diocese that his father had. And he did it. And he was bishop of Osim after his father. Now, the most famous story about these kinds of things, and I don't want to be scandalizing you too much, is the case of Pope Cyril III, known as Ibn al Cyril Ibn al was in the 13th century during the Crusades. And uh, he was known as Father Dawood Ibn al He was kind of an intellectual scholar guy. And for about 14 years, the church had no patriarch. Why? Because the camp that wanted Dawood Ibn al to be patriarch would pressure the government to stop the consecration of his rival and vice versa. So the government kept flopping back and forth, not wanting to allow the Copts to have a patriarch because they're constantly getting paid from the right hand and from the left to stop the other's consecration. Now imagine what happens if the church doesn't have a patriarch for 14 years. The patriarch ordains bishops, so bishops die and they are not replaced. The patriarch consecrates the miron, the chrism, so when you run out of chrism, you can't baptize anybody and you can't consecrate new churches. Everything slowly grinds to a halt if you don't have a patriarch in the church. 14 years. Imagine if you give birth to an infant, a boy or a girl, and until they are 14, their church had not had a patriarch. But to bring it back to our own context, we all intuitively understand that the Eucharist makes the church. We all repeat this famous adage. The Eucharist makes the church. We are a church because we partake of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without the Eucharist, we are essentially just a club or an organization. And honestly, one that is not very fun to be part of <laughs> because our activities are not that interesting. But one challenge to this Eucharistic understanding, this very focus on the Eucharist and the liturgy, one challenge, and I repeat this very conscious of what I'm saying, to us who are Orthodox and who are very liturgically minded is to reduce our faith, our church, our belonging to the body of Christ to liturgical functions alone. We just announced right now, for example, we're having a festival. That's not a liturgical function. We just need, we need help with uh, rolling grape leaves. That's not a liturgical function. And it shouldn't be considered uh, somehow superior to be doing anything else that is simply not outwardly liturgical. And let me explain what I mean by that. In the modern Coptic church, for example, every male boy is expected to become a deacon, regardless of their aptitude, regardless of their interest, regardless of whether uh, that large number of deacons is even needed for a given parish. Every boy is expected to go through this rite of passage at some point in their life to put on pretty vestments, to hold a candle, to say responses, to do things. So much emphasis on involvement, on, on active participation. It comes from a good place, but what it risks doing is to reduce our understanding of what it means simply to be a member of the body of Christ. Essentially, it has become unimportant to be anything but at least a deacon and above, and it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. Primarily what we do as church is to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are members of his holy nation, his very special people. We gather around his table and we pray. We offer to him our sacrifice of praise as we say in one of the hymns. And we receive from him the gifts of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that binds us together and that is a greater privilege to be part of that than to be part of anything else. Yes, even being a deacon or a priest or anything else. It's more important. But we don't live this very much, so we don't teach it very much to our children. We don't teach them that it is in fact sufficient to be a part of the church, to come early, come at 8 o'clock, be part of the prayers, 
You don't have to be blessed to, 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 to wear vestments or a tonia. We continue to do this until 9 o'clock, 9.30. Some churches do this. I've seen, I've seen uh, children get blessed to wear their vestments uh, right before the prayer of reconciliation. So after the sermon. And what I wonder, it's not a desire to punish the child, but I, what I wonder, what it is that you are contributing to the service at this point when you've come more than halfway through. We already have deacons. They're doing a fine job. They're chanting. They're reading the readings. They're helping at the altar. And here comes this little boy. It's not their fault. They're not driving. Their parents brought him late. But at the same time, what is this boy going to contribute by putting on vestments? Nothing. Simply reinforcing to them the notion that as an absaltos, as a deacon, they should wear these vestments every single liturgy, regardless of whether or not they're contributing anything to the service. And I know I'm speaking in a way that is different and that you don't hear in other churches, but I want to begin slowly to talk to the deacons about these things, and I will talk to you more about it in our Deacons Day in October. That we shouldn't be coming to the surface asking, what can the church do for me? The church grants me vestments, the church gives me a role, the church gives me candles to hold and responses to sing. But I should be asking what it is that I can do for the church. And that is service. What is it that I can do for the church? Ask not what the church can do for you, but what the, you can do for the church. But on the spiritual level, of course, on the personal level, this is also very important. And the Lord here says that if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Very famously, of course, St. Paul in Romans chapter 7 echoes the struggles of all of humanity, all of us, and says, that which I want to do, I do not. And that which I will not to do, I do. There's always that inner struggle inside of us between how we want to be and how we actually are. And many of us approach the sacrament of confession not realizing that we have to come to terms with this discord between who we actually are and who we want to be. But that's all that confession and repentance is. It's that bridging of that gap between what you actually are before the Lord and what you want to be before Him. I remember you know, 20 years ago um, was the first time I confessed before Abu Nakshoy. It's about 20 years ago or so. And I was sitting in his living room under this icon right here. And I, was, I think I was about, I don't know, 17, 18. And I came to him burdened with all of these sins, a laundry list of them. And in my naivete, I simply said, I do all the wrong things that I don't want to do. And I just wish God didn't give me so many options. So much freedom. And of course, Abuna told me what I probably knew already, but they don't want to admit that the Lord desires my own voluntary and loving conversion, not to take away my freedom to sin, but to have that freedom used for the good. Now fast forward 20 years, and when I heard my first confession as priest, the person confessing to me simply said, I've broken all the commandments. And they didn't want to elaborate any further, because again, we have trouble coming to terms with exactly how we have departed from this vision. For ourselves how exactly is our house divided within itself in our own souls we don't want to admit the details the details are the ugly parts i just finished reading a book on the life of metropolitan anthony bloom it's called this holy man and one of the chapters talks about how he approached confession so he used to take confessions in the in the empty church in a place like this what which what they call a, a proskinitarion you put an icon of christ here and he would stand on one side of it, and the person confessing would stand on the opposite side, and the Lord is between them. And he would bow his heads and listen. Now he tells this anecdote that this really old Russian woman comes to confession, and, and Metropolitan Anthony Bloom couldn't stand false piety. He wanted specifics so he could help the person. And the old Russian lady goes, forgive me, Father, I have broken all the commandments. And he looks at her with an, an responds to her in his Russian French accent and his dry humor. And he says, so you're 85 years old and you have committed adultery? <laughs> Obviously not. What he was trying to point out is that no, you have not broken all the commandments. You're breaking specific commandments and that's what's causing the distance between you and the Lord. 
And so you confess these sins to reunite you again and to fix the kingdom that is now divided against itself within your own soul. So the Lord desires our own voluntary, loving, productive conversion to Him so that our inner kingdom, our inner life itself is not divided against itself. And you know when things are not going well, when everything in your life doesn't feel like it's working quite the way that it has worked for you in the past. And you know when something is wrong and a distance has taken place between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you've worked on this, when you've worked on uh, correcting this division, this inner division between your body and your soul and your spirit, that's when truly the Lord can look at the people that are listening to Him and those who are doing His will. And He says, that is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Not just the Holy Virgin Mary, we celebrate tomorrow, uh, not, not only the saints and everybody else, but all those who do the will of God and listen to Him. May the Lord grant us uh, to, to live this life, to correct what it is that is causing division within our souls and also within our communities and our churches to the glory of God and Him be glory now and ever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.